why don't you see me in the, uh, in the break, after the first lecture in the break, okay? Just grab me in the break, okay? You had a, I didn't respond to your email the other day. Yeah, just, just grab me in the break, okay? Okay, we'll get rolling. Thanks. Okay, today we're going to deal first with the streptococci and then the staphylococci, and they are traditionally covered together because of the fact that you can confuse, one of, well, not that there are other reasons, of course, but you can confuse a streptococcus and a staphylococcus with a gram stain. And usually um, you're really concerned with not just characterizing uh, your, you know, what, strep, what streptococcus you've got, but also that it isn't a staphylococcus. And there's a scheme at the end of the, I don't know if I put it at the end of the first lecture, the day or the end of the second, which summarizes everything. It's in the handout as well at the end. So we'll go over that, we'll, we'll reach that point and then we'll take a quick look at that summary figure at the end. Okay, so let's start with the streptococci. And these are the key words and I've tried, uh, my colour schemes get messed up now and again. This is not the case today, we're talking about gram positives and gram negatives. We're talking about, everything we're talking about today are gram positive bacteria. Streptococci and staphylococci are both gram positive cocci. The reason I have broken these things up like this is everything up to here concerns the group A streptococcus. We're going to, there are a number of different groups and we're only going, to, only going to talk about, I think, maybe four, maybe if I fill in the mood, maybe mention five and six. But there are lots of different uh, streptococcal groups, almost as many as the, letters, as the letters of the alphabet. But we don't care about most of them in, in medical microbiology and in infectious diseases because they don't cause human disease. So we're emphasizing the ones that cause human disease. And this is the, group, the reason there's so much here about group, the group A streptococcus in particular, in the, as opposed to the other group of all streptococci, is because it's the one that, that's the, the most important in terms of human pathogenesis and human disease. Um, this, this covers the rest. And so we're going to be talking a lot about the group A streptococcus. We will emphasize also group B, which was only recognized in the past few years as being a major problem in, in uh, neonates and in the first few months of life. Um, and that concerns with group B. Group D we're going to discuss also because it, um, it causes opportunistic infections, but it, it causes uh, urinary tract infections occasionally. And I'll emphasize why um, when I get there, what the big deal is there. Okay, so these are the reasons for the breakdown in the blue and red today. The streptococci are facultative anaerobes. They are gram, that, that gram positive, they grow in chains or pairs, and they are catalase negative. And the emphasis on this catalase test is because staphylococci are catalase positive. Catalase is an enzyme that degrades hydrogen peroxide, as I've mentioned before, the detoxifying enzyme. And when hydrogen peroxide is broken down, it produces, it bubbles, it produces oxygen. So if you simply take a plate of streptococci, um, excuse me, a plate of staphylococci, and you add some hydrogen peroxide, if there's staphylococci there, they will bubble. Okay, now it's a little more complicated than that, it's beyond the scope of this course. Um, there's certain plates you can't do this on because they will contain catalase already, and that's irrelevant. So let, we're not going to go into the nuts and bolts, but the big deal is catalase. Whether the catalase, uh, catalase negative or catalase positive, that's the first, the second step in your identification. The first thing you're doing is looking under the microscope and seeing whether they're gram positive, whether they're in chains or pairs. The second step is then on a plate to see whether they're catalase positive or catalase, the colonies are catalase positive or catalase negative. This is what a typical streptococcus looks like and you can see that they grow in chains. Now, even a, even a typical situation like this, you will see occasionally some diplococci, because it all depends how the chain's broken up. The cells grow, they double, and they grow along the, in these chains, and sometimes they, they don't complete a chain. So the chains can be in different lengths, and it does look different from, from one, situ, one, um, organ, one strain to another. And sometimes if the person puts too many of these things on a, on a plate, on a uh, slide, and everything's mixed up together, you can confuse everything and you won't even see their chains. It just looks like a, 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 mass, a, a mass of cocci. And that's why you can confuse it with the staphylococcus. Um, sometimes the strains clump a little more than they should. So the gram stain is the first step in seeing whether you have a, a, probably have a streptococcus or a staphylococcus. It isn't 
the be-all and end-all of the universe. However, it is very important, and this is not a grand stain, this is a fluorescent stain of, of Streptococcus pneumoniae, and that's what I'm covering in the second lecture. And there are reasons that Streptococcus is, is covered separately because it is not groupable. I haven't defined what I mean by groupable yet, I will. But Streptococcus pneumoniae is not groupable. There is no group antigen for the Streptococcus pneumoniae. And for many years it wasn't even considered to be a Streptococcus, but it was thrown in with the Streptococci some years ago. And they don't usually, they do grow in as diplococci, pairs of cocci. Now, yes, of course, you know, sometimes they clump together and that looks like a clump. But if you look carefully in the, in the slide, you'll see the diplococci. So, the, the, knowing that something is a diplococcus is a good indication, not, not a be-all and end-all of the universe, but at least a beginning to say that it's not um, one of the other groupable streptococci, that it may be streptococcus pneumoniae. And the reason this is particularly a fluorescent stain is because it increases the, e the, e the ease of seeing things and the specificity of seeing things if you use an appropriate antibody. And you can look directly in something like a spinal fluid if you are... Um, you know, where you can do a rapid diagnosis if you're lucky enough that, you know, it will be 50% of the time or so, you will be lucky that you'll see something. So that's why that's... So this, these are gram-positive diplococci. Diplococci is a generic term. There are gram-negative organisms that also um, are diplococci. They will be gram-negative diplococci. And I emphasise that because the streptococcus is such a common and major human pathogen so I believe it's on the, still on the top 10 killers in this country. It's referred to as the pneumococcus. So don't confuse, and that's why that's not capitalised there. So don't confuse pneumococcus, a specific name for the pneumococcus, with diplococcus, a general term for organisms that grow as pairs, pairs of cocci. Okay, so now we're not going to talk much more. We're going to, we're going to separate pneumococcus off now to the next lecture along with staph. Now we're going to deal with the groupable streptococci. All right, so the streptococci and the singular is streptococcus, the genus name. Cocci is the plural. The streptococci are, are primarily differentiated from one another by, as by the Lansfield groups, named after Rebecca Lansfield, who in the 30s and 40s originally developed an antibody scheme for not only differentiating the groups from each other, but for typing strains. And it's, refer, it's named after her as the Lansfield group. The Lansfield groups are generally, uh, I mentioned this in the handout, um, but I want to emphasise it here. They are carbohyd usually carbohydrate antigens. Some of them could be tychoic acids, but tychoic acids, if you remember, are also based on carbohydrates. So they're, so they're referred to as carbohydrate or polysaccharide antigens. Um, as opposed to the other, the M proteins that we're going to be talking about, which by definition, we say group, we don't often really say what we're talking about. We might, you know, so all this time say groupable polysaccharides or groupable carbohydrates. We just say the group antigens and they are generally polysaccharides. They're almost pretty well always polysaccharides. The other, some of the other things we do with M proteins to type strains are not polysaccharides. They, they, they are proteins. Now among the groupable streptococci, the, by far the most common are A, B, D and A, B and D. We got interested here at USC in C, simply because the head of the Student Health Center here was very interested in it, so I've published a couple of articles on Group C, but G, G and F are just almost unheard of, and unless you work at the CDC and run the strep department at the CDC, you'll probably, you're unlikely to see a G or an F streptococcus. They do very occasionally cause human disease. So the big deal is A, B, a, B and D, and I don't know outside this course whether Anybody will even mention group C, G or F to you. So we're going to emphasise A, B and D. Those are the big deal. All right. Non-groupable. Streptococcus pneumonia, as I've already said, does not have a group antigen. There is no antigen common among the strains of different strains of pneumococcus for which an antibody will recognise. There's a lot of variability among the pneumococci. In addition, they're covered with a, with a very large thick capsule which would block a lot of antibodies binding to places where you might find the group antigen, that is to say in the cell wall. But regardless of the explanation, streptococcus pneumoniae are not groupable. 
Another group that we, we talk about is the viridan streptococci. Now, you do come, there are viridan streptococci are very common in the human flora. They don't generally cause disease. If this was a dental school, we'd be very, very interested in Streptococcus mutans, which is believed to be involved in dental caries. But as regards human health, and um, I mean medical health as opposed to dental health, um, we, the very dense Streptococci are you know, not considered as important as the, for, for, as the other Streptococci. But you do get infections, opportunistic infections with the very dense Streptococci because they are very common in the, in the pharynx of the human, uh, among the human normal flora. Okay, now in addition to the Lancefield grouping, which is an, where antibodies have been made that recognise different polysaccharides found in the different groups, there's a second way that, that you do things, because antibodies are often expensive to prepare, and they may not always be available, they go off, you, put them in, you store them, they, they, they uh, go off. Sometimes you resort to an alternative scheme. Okay, now... Hemolysis, I should say, regardless of what scheme you do, is very important in addition because you're always going to grow the group A streptococcus or any other streptococcus on a, on a, on a, on a sheep blood agar plate. And so you're not going to ignore what happens on that plate even if you do group the antigens afterwards. Streptococci fall into three categories, alpha, beta or gamma, as regards the hemolysis reaction, the ability to digest blood. This is shown as a viridan, uh, as an alpha, or um, what you see typically as a viridan streptococci, and this, is, this kind of relates to partial degradation of, of hemoglobin, and it's not quite clear what this green colour is, but the, the coloration around the colonies is green, and that's alpha hemolysis. Beta hemolysis refers to complete clearing of the blood around the colonies. They will essentially be translucent, transparent. Gamma is simply means nothing really. It's just it isn't alpha or beta. Gamma, gamma simply says there's no lysis. Okay? So what we're looking for is, is there lysis? Is it alpha or is it beta or is there no lysis? Particularly important is the beta hemolysis, as you will see shortly. The beta hemolysis is the most, uh, is certainly the most important thing, and you'll see why. Okay, so groups A and B are, and there's no such thing as always in this world, but the vast bulk of group, of, of group A and group B strains are beta hemolytic. They're often referred to as beta hemolytic streptococci for that reason. The group D can be alpha or gamma, and as I've mentioned, streptococcus pneumoniae and the viridan streptococci are non Hemolytic. Now that should say gamma, that's a typo. No, hang on a second, I'm sorry. Alpha, alpha or gamma? Actually, that's right, Gal alpha, excuse me, alpha. Yeah. Okay, so beta again is the big deal here. If you see that you've got beta hemolysis, you're immediately homing in on a group A or a group B streptococcus. And you'll see that, in fact, not just the, the beta hemolysis, but the clinical aspects of things along with the beta hemolysis is going to tell you an awful lot. And let's see why. Okay, so hemolysis, the one way you can identify the streptococci is the hemolysis reaction, which you're basically always going to do, again, because you're going to grow these things on sheep blood agar. Plus one characteristic, that's a presumptive identification. Let's look at these one characteristics. All right, let's deal first with the group A streptococcus. And we're going to talk about the, we'll give an example when we get there. Um, okay. Now, the group A streptococcus, um, it varies from decade to decade, from, you know, from literally does over decades, sort of what, what, we, what we say about the group A streptococcus. This, this is true. The group A streptococcus infection affects all ages with a peak incidence at 5 to 15 years of age, which is why it's very common for, for, for parents to take their kids to the, to, the, uh, to the doctor to be treated with this. There's a lot of fear about the group A streptococcus and a lot of misunderstanding about the group A streptococcus among parents and probably even some physicians, I'm sure, but hopefully not graduates of the USC School of Medicine. And we'll see why, we'll see why in a little bit. Okay, streptococcus pyogenes can produce separative or non-separative reactions. Separative refers to pussy. It refers to pus. It refers to 
as opposed to the, the non-suppurative we're going to talk about next when it comes to the group A streptococcus. Streptococcus pyogenes is not invasive. There are a number of major human pathogens that are invasive, and that, as we've already discussed numerous times now, is a big deal. Because once something gets out of, the, in this instance, the throat, or in the case of the group B streptococcus, um, it gets into the bloodstream, into the brain, we have a big problem. This is not an invasive organism, generally. In fact, we'd have said never until the last few years, until the last 10 years or so. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, the, we now know that there is a, there's, a, there's a new form, not so new anymore, but at one point, to me, was new anyway. Uh, one sees an inv there's an invasive bacteremia can also occur, which is not the typical or major, uh, the classical um, disease that one sees in a, in a, in a uh, group A streptococcal infection. The very, almost no people who get a pharyngeal infection would have an invasive bacteremia. You would always not even think about invasive bacteremia when it comes to a strep throat, which most of you heard the term before. Invasive bacteremia was described more recently. It's called toxic shock-like, which gives you some idea, as I've said before, that it's a new, newer disease because toxic shock was undescribed in the 80s. And this was, uh, I imagine, within, I don't remember the exact date, but within five to ten years of that. So that's why it's toxic shock-like, because it was described after toxic shock syndrome caused by the group, by, by Staphylococcus aureus that I'll talk about later. And you've heard the terms that are often used were used in the newspapers. There was even pictures on Newsweek and places like this. But it was flesh-eating bacteria, myonecrosis. The organisms produce a potent toxin and the flesh actually gets degraded and sort of becomes necrotic. And so the reason it's talked about is not because it's so common, it's because it's so nasty. Okay, if you get it, you, you may well die from it, which is not going to be the case with the typical... Uh, pharyngeal infection by the group A streptococcus. Okay, so you'd almost, you see no discussion about this in newspapers or magazines or what have you. You, wouldn't have, you would have done about this and you would get totally the wrong impression if you just went with the notoriety. That is the standard streptococcal infection, group A streptococcal infection. The organisms produce um, can produce the superantigen, which, you, which I'm sure the immunologists discussed, which is a T-cell mitogen, usually referred to as a superantigen rather than a mitogen, but it is a mitogen, and it non-specifically activates the immune system, produce many different clones of recognising all sorts of antigens that wouldn't normally be recognised. And presumably we see a, we're seeing a contribution of various cytokines and what have you as a consequence that are being produced, which leads to, can lead to shock aspects. A disease that is almost unheard of, but those of you who like to read romantic novels will, will come across this, scarlet fever, which is um, a disease which we saw a lot maybe a hundred years ago, where there's a rash and refers to as erythrogenic toxin causing it. Now, the non, now I want to talk about the non suppurative aspects. And, you know, for a while, I remember I used to lecture on this, I used to say, well, go to Trinidad if you want to see rheumatic fever. You know, but there, what happened was is that when there was a resurgence of this unique disease, the invasive bacteremia that I've already discussed, the non suppurative form of disease caused by the group A streptococcus is, the, is, is a very severe disease and was very, very rare in this country. It's still not common. But we've seen that we did see a resurgence. There was a few clusters of this occurred, you know, in the past 10 years or so. And so, we don't dismiss this so much anymore. But even if, we, even, if we, even if it didn't occur very much, what we should understand is that treatment in group A pharyngitis, streptococcal pharyngitis, you are not treating so much the actual throat infection. Yes, it's very nasty to get a throat infection. Yes, if you, yes even if it doesn't spread, you may feel pretty bad if you get a throat infection. But, you're not going to, but with a group A streptococcal infection, as opposed to diphtheria, you're not going to die from a throat infection with a group A streptococcus. And certainly, you're not having your children treated, usually, because of the issue of trying to, of just the issue of ridding the organism from the throat. In fact, many people believe that it may not even, it doesn't, it may cut down the residence of, it, it believes to cut down the residence of the organism in the throat and the production of antigens, but it may not have a, much of an effect on the actual course of the disease. In addition to, to treating the actual throat infection, what you're really treating for in a pharyngeal 
um, infection with a group A streptococcus is the non-suppurative aspects, the things you don't want to happen. The non-suppurative aspects are referred to as rheumatic fever, which is an inflammatory disease. It is life-threatening and there are chronic sequelae. It can take months. You can have, perhaps you might have, for example, had a streptococcal, group A streptococcal infection and it's gone in a few days. Whether you treat or you don't treat, it's usually gone in a few days. A few weeks, a few months, and in some cases even a few years later, you may find that you've suddenly developed rheumatic fever, which is not an active infection. There is no infection going on in rheumatic fever. It is an inflammatory disease, particularly of the, as it says, the fever itself is systemic of the heart when it's referred to as rheumatic carditis, and of the joints when it's referred to as rheumatic arthritis, as, and I did say rheumatic, and I didn't say rheumatoid. There's often a misconception about the association between the group A streptococcus and arthritis. Rheumatic arthritis is extremely, like the other severe non suppurative aspects, are uncommon in this country. But rheumatic arthritis is an inflammatory arthritis that can occur as a, one of the consequences of rheumatic fever associated with a prior staphylococcal infection of the throat. It is nothing to do with rheumatoid arthritis and there is no evidence whatsoever that streptococcus have got anything to do with rheumatoid arthritis, which as you know is one of the two major rheumatic diseases along with osteoarthritis that we have in this country. Okay, so I said rheumatic, not rheumatoid. Yeah? Can you explain what makes them not suppurative? yeah. Supp well, basically in suppuration, you're particularly talking about white blood cells. You're talking about the organisms, a lot of organisms are present, causing an influx of white blood cells, polymorphonuclear cells in particular. That's what pus is. Okay, and that's what you particularly will see. It's not the, you, know, you, you may not see pus um, in a pharyngitis, but, but it's one of the things you can see in a pharyngitis is pus. Okay, in rheumatic fever, you, know, you may have had the pussy suppurative features, you know, say a few weeks, a few months beforehand, but you don't usually, you don't usually have an active pussy or suppurative pharyngitis going on. And if you look in the sites where the inflammation is going on, such as the height, if you did some pathology, did some histology on the heart, for example, or the joints, you would not see streptococci. What you would see is an infiltrate in the acute stages of polymorphonuclear cell infiltration and in the late stages of a, a, um, a mononuclear cell infiltration. But you wouldn't see organisms and you wouldn't see pus as such. Okay? And you can see pus in septic arthritis, for example. If you ever take a fluid out of somebody's joint who's got septic arthritis, it's often very pussy and yellow and it does not look like normal synovial fluid. Okay, this is nuts. Okay, so is that, that clear enough? Suppurative and non-suppurative is as different as it gets. Okay, but they're both linked together here because the initiating event is suppurative. The chronic events that occur are non-suppurative. Okay, now, so the point is, if somebody gets rheumatic carditis, it may be very rare. But when it occurs, it's unless treated, you have a dead patient. Now, if you've got a strep throat, and as I've said already, and it, and, it, and it may help a little bit the treatment, but it may not help a lot in terms of the pharyngitis, what it does do is it decreases the incidence time of the organism in the throat, and it, produces the, the it decreases the time period in which antigen is being produced by the group A streptococcus. And these antigens are what's involved, and I'll talk about that mechanism next, are what's involved in causing this inflammation, in this chronic inflammation. And even though it's rare, you know, it isn't, isn't rare to the person that dies of it. Okay, so that's what we're doing in, 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 in treatment of group A streptococcal infections. We're predominantly trying to make sure the person doesn't go on to do our best to make sure they don't go on to develop rheumatic carditis in particular. Okay, so let's talk more about, now we're talking about etiology. We've given a hint so far of what's going on, but we haven't discussed the details. Rheumatic fever, and it could be, it didn't matter if I said rheumatic fever, arthritis, rheumatic arthritis, rheumatic carditis, these are different clinical features of rheumatic fever. Fever, carditis, or, or arthritis. You don't always necessarily get all together. You might just get a carditis, you might just get the systemic fever, you might just get the, the arthritis. But regardless, this is what we see in rheumatic fever. Okay, the M protein, and I did say M protein and not M polysaccharide, cross-reacts with the heart's myosin, and that's definite. There is a, no discussion, this has been known for at least 30 years now. There is a cross-reactivity between the M protein and the human myosin. 
That is classical autoimmunity. Many times you will, in, your, in the course of your careers, people will use the word, you will maybe, I hope you won't, but some of your colleagues will use the term autoimmunity and it will mean absolutely nothing. What it actually means is we don't know what's going on, so we call it autoimmune just to make, make it sound like we know what we're talking about and to sound smart to our patients. But in this case, it's real. There is an autoimmunity going, it is defined, it is clear, it is obvious, it is known. And many people feel that the M protein the, causes cross-reactivity with the heart myosin and that results in an autoimmune reaction, cell-mediated immunity against the heart itself, the heart valve in particular. Um, whether that's true in this day and age, the, the fact that this occurs is true, whether that's what happens, your guess is as good as mine. I come from a different school which didn't believe that, so I'm going to mention this other school of thought as well. The second, so the point is, is that if you've got cross-reactivity, if you've got immunological reactivity to the M protein, it doesn't matter if there's an infection going on. An antibody couldn't care less, or a, or, a, or a T cell couldn't care less. Once the bacteria are gone, if the immunity is there and it recognizes the heart, it's going to recognize the heart. It couldn't care less whether the organism's there or not. And that's why in the chronic secondary there is no organism present. Now, just to confuse medical students, it turns out that the, the, the cell wall of the group A streptococcus is very poorly biodegradable. And if you actually, and if you actually induce arthritis or carditis in animals, you don't even need the organism itself. You can just take the purified cell walls, inject them into the animals, and they will produce diseases that remember, resemble carditis or arthritis, human carditis or human arthritis. You don't even have to inject live, live, the live organism into these animals. So there are two schools of thought. This is predominant one. This is probably what you'll see in your boards. But there certainly is another school of thought going all the way back to Rebecca Lansfield. And I, I come from that group, probably the, the grandchild or something like that, basically, scientifically. And basically, that's another possibility. Regardless, in, it doesn't matter in terms of the, there is definitely an immunopathologic disease going on and there are no live bacteria in the chronic sequelae as opposed to the suppurative, state, the, uh, the suppurative stages in the pharynx. Okay. You're getting the idea why we, you know, we talk about the group A streptococcus. It is the, the 90 percent of the work in the streptococcus of any level has been going on with the group A streptococcus and still is. So, now, rheumatic fever, again, penicillin terminates the pharyngitis and decreases the likelihood of developing carditis. Okay? I should mention another disease more of historical importance that does crop up now and again. Immunologists like this because it's the classic um, disease that occurs in human beings that's the model of immune complex disease that Dr. Kafar mentioned to you. He may have even discussed uh, acute streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And this is distinct in that it actually appears that we get immune complexes, antigen, antibody complexes, lodging in the kidneys. And that's distinct from the etiology of rheumatic fever. Okay, now the major pathogenesis factors, fortunately the major pathogenesis factors don't change much regardless of all this complexity that we've talked about already. The major pathogenesis factors, and I've purposely put these two together and have made no effort to separate them because classically people claim that the lipotrichoic acid was the big deal. Later on they referred to a fibronectin or F-protein. Regardless, I'm, not, I'm going to just say that lipotrichoic acid and F-protein have both been suggested to be involved. They are both present in the fimbriae, the surface antigen, the surface of the group A streptococcus, and they are involved in binding to the epithelial cells. So that's the first thing that happens. The M protein is antiphagocytic. And is it important? You better believe it is. It's not a theoretical thing. There have been vaccines made against the group A streptococcus which actually will protect in animals. Whether anybody will ever be brave enough or, smart or stupid enough to inject an M, M protein vaccine into a group of human beings is another matter altogether because not only is this M protein protective, it also contains the epitopes that cross-react with the heart. And there has been a lot of work done to try and work out which epitopes are protective and which ones cause disease or, or could cause disease. And maybe one of, the, one of these days in places where the incidence of, of, is, is much higher. And again, we just because we have a vaccine doesn't mean we're going to use it. Okay? 
All right, so you don't generally vaccinate, you don't vaccinate against the group A streptococcus in this country. There's absolutely no reason to vaccinate. It would be ridiculous to vaccinate because it would be very expensive and really wouldn't achieve an awful lot. But the M protein is the, is definitely the, along with the, um, the, uh, the adhesins, these are the two major pathogenesis factors. And this is certainly the, is the most important pathogenesis factor uh, in, in group A streptococcal infections. To return to a slide that I showed earlier, as I said I would when I get to the individual disease, I said I'll go through this again. Here's a slide we showed in the pathogenesis lecture, and I remind you, there's an epithelium, that's in the pharynx. Here's some fibronectin bound to the epithelium, and um, you can see the, um, the lipopsychoic acid F protein with its, with its antigens on the end binding by an adhesin receptor interaction through fibronectin to epithelial cells. That's fibronectin as opposed to fibrinogen, which we're going to talk about next, which has got nothing to do with adhesion. Okay, so that's the first. Step. That's why the adhesion is... So that's, that's what we took the two pathogenesis factors, adhesion and um, survival, lack of killing by macrophages, not polymorphonuclear cells. Now, I, did, I showed you this one earlier, I believe, but I didn't show you that one. Because what I like to try and do is introduce things, introduce things one step at a time. You can take something in, and then as it gets more complicated, we've got something to build on. So you've had this before. You haven't had that before. In a non-immune individual, what's going to happen is that the, the organism um, is, has got the peptidoglycan of this organism will activate complement. It will bind complement. That that's been shown experimentally. What will happen is fibrinogen in, in the um, bloodstream will block the binding of um, complement to the peptidoglycan. So this is a, an, a protection mechanism of the organism. It's trying to avoid phagocytosis. It's an extracellular pathogen. It's trying to avoid being killed by a, by a uh, phagocyte. But in an immune individual, that's not what happens. What happens in an immune individual is that the antibody now presumably displaces some of the fibrinogen, binds to the, um, surf, uh, binds to the um, surface of the organism through the M protein, and then we see activation of complement through the classical pathway as opposed to the alternate pathway, which Dr. Fino discussed with you. And so now we see that there is going to be complement and, anti and FC receptors through the antibodies on the surface of these organisms. And that does terminate the infection. And that's why, one of the major reasons why, if you don't treat, I'm not saying you shouldn't treat somebody. If somebody's got strep throat, you certainly should treat them because of the possibility of development of rheumatic carditis. I want to make that clear. But if you didn't treat, what would happen is the person would become immune, would develop antibodies to the M protein of that particular organism, and, it, and the disease would be terminated. Now, some of you are saying to yourself, yeah, but I know people who've had multiple bouts of, of, uh, of uh, strep throat. And the reason is because the M protein has got a lot of variability from one type to another type. And that's why we talk about, we need to differentiate between type immunity and group antigens. Okay, so the carbohydrate antigens will recognize basically all strains within that group. But the M protein has got epitopes that are different among different strains of streptococci. And so if you, if you go ahead and you and have an infection with one strain, you'll get immunity to that M protein and the certain disease will not come back with that strain. But it may well come back with another strain and that's why people can get multiple bouts of infection with the group A streptococcus. So, the M protein is extremely important as a pathogenesis factor. Yes, there are lots of exotoxins that we've talked about, a number of exotoxins. But in terms of the generality, it is the major target of natural immunity. There is strain variation among these antigens. And indeed, reinfection can occur with a different strain, for the reasons I've just given. Um, classically, it was said that the capsule was totally unimportant in group A streptococcal infections. And then nature did us all a disservice and we had to learn new things. And we found out there, was a, there were new, some of these new strains I've talked about that came about in the last few years tend to have very mucoid capsules and are, the capsules are definitely antiphagocytic. So that's why we particularly emphasize mucoid strains 
Uh, and they, they, they're among the newer strains that cause the flesh-eating disease and, al- and also the newer strains that cause, um, uh, that cause the, reassert- the re-emergence of a few clusters here and there of rheumatic carditis. So you have to look carefully. I mean, I, I'm not going to go out of my way to make a big fuss in this course, but you have to really look at the question. Not because, not because people are trying to be tricky, because the world has changed. Okay? The classical capsular, the, the classic is in group-based streptococcal disease, the capsule has nothing whatsoever to do with it. It's the M protein. But in some of these newer strains, the mucoid strains, they unfortunately do have very antiphagocytic capsule, which is presumably one of the reasons why we've seen the re-emergence of these newer variants of group-based streptococcal disease. Okay, isolation identification. Well, I talked earlier about uh, the hemolysis reaction and one feature for identification. If there's beta hemolysis, that's a very good start. If you know somebody's had a nasty um, pharyngeal infection and you, see, you isolate beta hemolytic colonies, that's a good indication in its own right that it's probably a group A streptococcus, but it isn't good enough because group C streptococcus, for example, can cause pharyngitis occasionally. So what you do is you always have another test. You put a bactotracin disc, for example, on a plate. And why am I emphasizing this so much here? Because many physicians are chosen in this country. They, may not, they, may, they don't usually have private physicians outside hospitals, don't tend to have microbiology labs. But many cases they have chosen to, um, to make an exception and, maybe, and, and try and make a rapid, di- a rapid diagnosis of strep throat because they want to know whether to give the person pe- penicillin or not. This is not rapid. Okay. Beta hemolysis, and we see if the bactotracin disinhibits growth. That's one simple way to say if it's a group A streptococcus or not. The other thing you can do is, do, is look at for the beta hemolytic colonies on a sheet blood agar plate and see if you can find the presence of a group A antigen there, which is a very simple thing to do. That's culture. That's not rapid strep kit tests because it takes generally about 24 to 48 hours to do this successfully because the colonies are very small for the group A streptococcus and they take a while to grow up before you can see the beta hemolysis. Beta hemolysis, there are two hemolysins produced by this organism. Um, one is sensitive to oxygen and one is not. And what that means is a lot of times people will stab a plate in order to really see the hemolysis because you want to get the colony growing in the agar rather than just on the agar so that you can get the oxygen concentration down. That's why people stab these things a lot of times. But anyway, these are two different hemolysins. One is sensitive to oxygen and one is insensitive and that's what's involved in beta hemolysis. That's why we need to know about it. I gave you one example of a rapid strep kit some, uh, a few days ago. This is the sort of test that things are really done nowadays. It's a little more complicated to understand it, but, but it's worth doing because you may well be using this test in your own offices, or at least your nurses or technicians or whatever. Don't, you'll ever do it yourself. But basically, the, the rapid strep test, the throat swab, Okay, you will, take a, you will take a throat swab, you will extract the streptococcal antigen. The kit, you, the, the commercial kit that you buy will often be a liposome, a, a lipid mixture, with antibodies embedded in it or on it. What will happen is, if there's no anti, if the, the you'll take a disc which already has an antibody impregnated on it, you don't have to do anything, you just buy this thing. You take this, um, this mixture along with the, um, the, the extract and you, put, you, you bind them together and if, the, if there's antigen present, it forms a complex between the, um, the antibody and this, um, this dye. And it causes the, thing, the dye to stick through the antibody down to the antigen. You're going to commish and it sticks. If you don't have any antigen present, you don't, the whole thing goes straight through the disc and there's no colour there. And it can be different colours and different variations and variants and thereof, and they don't always use liposomes, but this is the basic principle. It's a very simple test, and you can get a result. With modern tests, you can get a result in a few minutes. If you don't know what you're doing, some of the older tests, it takes a couple of hours to extract the antigen. Why is that a big deal? Because your patients don't want to sit around for a couple of hours. They want to go home. Okay, so if you pick the right kit, you can do it quickly, and they can go home. Otherwise, you have to call them later or call them next day and let them know what's going on. Okay, so this is the rapid strep test kit. 
All right, now, post-infectious diagnosis. Most of the time, we couldn't care less about post-infectious diagnosis. If somebody's got a bacterial infection, you treat it, it goes away, they go home, they're done, they're finished, everybody's happy. But that's not the case with group A streptococcal infections. As I've mentioned already, the non-suppurative aspects can occur a long time after the event, a long time after the initial infectious event. And the problem, so what happens is, this is where there are a number of antigens produced by this organism. I just mentioned the most common one, streptolysin O. There are, you will basically look in the patient's serum to see if they have developed antibodies to streptolysin O. You'll do this not because you want to do this, because it's a, it's a more difficult thing to do serology than it is in other things. You do it because you have no choice, because the infection's gone away. And you want to know why did somebody come down with something that looks like rheumatic carditis, but you're not sure because there's no infection going on. So by doing serology, you can see if there's been a rising titer of antibodies to this, this, um, anti these antigens. And it's important in late or delayed diagnosis, late features. And that's serology. And there should be no confusion by this point between serology versus detecting antigen. That's antibodies we're talking about here, which take weeks or months to develop. Okay, so that's group A strep. Now, I talked a lot about groupable antigens, again, Groupable antigens are carbohydrates, polysaccharides, some of them that might be tychoic acids, but it's, most people just refer to them as car carbohydrates or polysaccharide antigens. The typing antigens, when you want to know what strain you've got, and in this case you do care, because it may be associated with a particular clinical feature, or it may be that you'll want to know why the thing keeps coming back. Done usually again in reference laboratories, not in routine or clinical laboratories. You can traditionally one could serotype by looking at what type of M and the two other antigens that are found on the protein antigens found on the cell surface referred to as T and R. I didn't mention them earlier because M is the major pathogenesis factor and these two things are not very important, in, if important at all in pathogenesis. There are typing antigens there. Now nowadays what's going to happen is, is that the vast bulk of people are going to sequence the genes coding for the M protein, which differ just as they differ at the protein level in terms of their antigenic constituents, the genes differ in their sequence, there are sequence variations in the genes coding for the M protein, and that's the one that's largely done nowadays. Um, again, you would not see that in a routine laboratory, and more sophisticated, larger uh, labo uh, clinical microbiology laboratories would be able to do this. Okay, that's group A. And surprise, surprise, it's now 20 to, to, to 11, and we talked mostly about the group A streptococcus, as I said, we would. There's not much to say about the group B streptococcus or any other things by comparison. That doesn't make it unimportant, just because there's not as much to say. The group B streptococcus was recognised as being a big problem a lot later than the group A streptococcus. And it doesn't cause any of these complications, this supper, uh, these non-suppurative aspects, and all these, which have nothing to do with the group B streptococcus. This is a typical bacterial infection, nothing different than a hemolysis infection or a pneumococcal infection or what have you. The woman, the mother, um, the birth canal may well be, have group B streptococci growing there as part of the normal flora. The, the mother is perfectly happy, she doesn't have a problem. When the baby is born, it could be very shortly after birth, it may be a little bit delayed in some cases, but certainly in the first few, few, few months. The neonate may well develop, well, the young, very young baby may well develop a septicemia, which then leads to a meningitis. Any time you hear the, word, hear the word meningitis, you should be scared because, some, because meningitis can kill very rapidly. Septicemia is bad enough, but meningitis you worry about. And of course, that's why people are very concerned because it's not that it's such a major occurrence, but it is, it, this is one of the leading causes of neonatal meningitis. Okay? So that's why we care about this organism. There isn't a lot to say about it pathogenesis-wise because we don't see all these horrible complications that we see with the group A streptococcus. We just see one, and that's bad enough. Okay, so this is, a, a, this is the group B is the second most important disease among the groupable streptococci. And again, we do, a hemolysis, we do the hemolysis reaction with one other reaction. Here you've got a choice. In one case, you prefer it first to as hippurate hydrolysis, which is a very simple thing to do, colour reaction. Um, I, saw, I remember some years ago, I saw a review written by somebody who knows a hell of a lot more than I'll ever know about the group B streptococcus and referred to the cyclic AMP reaction. 
And that is totally wrong, and it is not written with a small c, it is written with a large c, and you don't need to remember what it stands for. It stands for Christy Atkins Munch Peterson, but you don't need to remember that. It's the camp reaction, not the cyclic AMP reaction. And it was, descri- it was named after the people that originally described it. And I don't know if I put a picture in here or not. Maybe not. But basically all you do is you simply grow a sta- appropriate strain of staphylococcus next to a streptococcus, and you see if the hemolysis is increased of the staphylococcus. That's referred to as the camp reaction. Increased beta hemolysis of staph aureus. Yes, but staph aureus is also beta hemolytic and that's why you could easily confuse it with a streptococcus along with the confusion that I talked about with the streps group uh, with the uh, gram typing, uh, gram uh, staining already. So the CAMP reaction, not the cyclic AMP reaction, increases beta hemolysis of staph aureus. You can do one or the other. There's probably no reason to do both. They're just different, but they, they both work well. Group D streptococci are among the group we consider among of opportunists. Um, so that's why we discuss group D. It's not really a major disease, except for the, um, I'll talk about urinary tract infections in a little bit. Now, the group D are groupable, and nowadays we know they're not streptococci at all, but being by the fact that we're all unwilling to change, we still refer to them as streptococci. Sometimes they're referred to as enterococci. But the group D streptococci or enterococci, whatever you wish to call them, they will grow on bilis glinaga and produce a black precipitate. And you want to differentiate among the enterococci, and, and by now you know what you've heard this word entero in other situations, that means associated with the, with the guts. And it shouldn't be a shock, because that's where the enterococci can be found. And it also shouldn't be a shock that if it's in the, if it's in the gut, it can spread from the gut, um, from the intestine, for example, you're at the bath bathroom and wipe inappropriately, you may find that you, it can end up uh, causing a urinary tract infection. It also, are, these, are much more, these are much more likely to cause opportunistic infections. So you want to know whether you have an enterococcus as opposed to you don't have an enterococcus. So that, in this particular case, the test is designed, is it an enterococcus or isn't it an enterococcus? Once you know that it is, first you know that it's a group D streptococcus. The estetococci, as I've already said, are distantly related to other streptococci, but we still, they've traditionally been covered with the other streptococci. The grouping tests are done as the, as against the streptococci. We know nowadays that genetically they're not streptococci at all. They are in the, referred to as the genus enterococcus. So you may see either designation. You may see them referred to as enterococcus fecalis or fecium. You may see them referred to as streptococcus fecalis or fecium or other versions thereof. So you need to know that when you thought that it's referring to the group D. They are found as in the gut flora. They cause urinary tract infections from fecal contamination. They also cause opportunistic infections. Now, one thing I want to make clear, the most common gram-negative urinary tract infections by the by, by, well, When you think about urinary tract infections in general, you think about gram-negative bacteria, such as particularly E. coli, as I've said earlier. Gram-positive infections are very uncommon, urinary tract infections are quite uncommon. I don't, I don't mean by they never, because they may be 5, 10% or less. But if you've got a gram-positive urinary tract infection, one of the most likely that you're going to have is an enterococcus. Okay, so that's why urinary tract infections are emphasised with the enterococcus, not because they're so common, because the vast bulk are gram-negative, not gram-positive. But again, if you get a gram-positive urinary tract infection, it may well be an enterococcus. And why do we care? Because they're resistant to many antibiotics. And unfortunately, there have been some strains that have been shown, which are one of the last-line drugs is vancomycin. And this, to some of the enterococci actually have a terminal dialin replaced by lactate. And so they're resistant to vancomycin, so one of the last-line drugs. Okay, I've got uh, one more thing I want to cover here now. Okay, now everything we've talked about so far, everything is relative. This, can be, this term minute can be a little confusing. Streptococci produce small colonies, period. Staphylococci produce large colonies in general. Typical streptococci are small colonies, they take a couple of days to grow up. Staphylococci produce much bigger colonies, they grow much faster. But there's a variant of streptococci, so we're not comparing them here to staphylococci, we're comparing them to other streptococci that already have small colonies. These colonies are referred to as minute. Now, the reason this is important is, is, is as follows. There can be various groups 
among these minute colonies, um, staphylococci. Some of them might even be group A. Now, I've already told you, see group A, you get scared because you, don't, you worry about rheumatic carditis. Well, yes, these, some of these minute colonies actually have a group A antigen. Not all of them. Some can be group C, some can be group G, some can be group F. But if they've got a group A present and you don't know anything about streptococci, and for example, let's say you did a rapid strep uh, test and didn't culture first, you might find some antigen there. And you might say, my God, the person's, person's got strep throat. Well, maybe they don't. Maybe they just happen to have some of these boring, dull, minute colony streptococci present as part of their normal flora, and they don't have strep throat. So that's why we differentiate the two. Usually the large colony streptococci, as I've already said, are beta hemolytic. The minute colony are very hard to see in the first place, the colonies. And yes, if you blew that up, I actually did try to be accurate with this. I think I actually did show beta hemolysis, but you can't see it because they're so small. Okay, so the point is you could confuse these yeah, these might not be beta hemolytic, there might be some other form of hemolysis. But you, the point, the major issue is here is that, you, is that these minute colony streptococci, regardless of whether they're group A or not, do not cause rheumatic fever or rheumatic carditis. Okay? So it's done, you know, because we, we don't want to be confused. Okay, so that's my minute colony. I think, yeah, one more slide. Okay. Finally, the viridan streptococci. If, you, if it isn't group A and it isn't group B, and it isn't group D, and there's not much left. Like, okay, well, what, and it isn't a pneumococcus, which we have specific tests for. What is it? Well, it could be a viridan streptococcus. They are diverse species. There are so many of them that I don't think it's even worth remembering the names. They're present they're orally. They can cause dental caries. And they, they do cause opportunistic infections. I'm not minimizing their importance. What I'm saying is, is that you just don't, generally don't have specific tests for the species. They're usually alpha hemolytic and as it, negative for other tests. That's the point. It's done by elimination. If once you've shown it's not everything else, then okay, well, that's what's left. That's how you do it. They're not groupable. S mutans is particularly, Streptococcus mutans is particularly emphasized because it is, uh, it's, been, it's suggested to be involved in dental caries. And also, sometimes when people are having teeth extracted or other work done on their gums and what have you, the organism can get into the bloodstream from the tooth, the dental work. And it does cause, uh, not uncommonly, an, an endocarditis, an actual infection of the heart, as opposed to what I said with the group A streptococcus, which is not an infection of the heart. This is an actual infection. It gets into the bloodstream and gets to the heart. And that's why people are very concerned who have, um, for example, if you've had a prior incidence of rheumatic carditis, you're not going to worry that this thing's going to cause rheumatic carditis. You say, okay, well, I've already got heart problems, and now I'm going to have, a, have an organism introduced from my dental work which might exacerbate a pre-existing condition. So you would often treat a dentist, might well treat this person with antibiotics, as an example, because of fear of the development of endocarditis. It's not a major thing. It's not, it's not like it's so common with, you know, anybody should worry about it unless you happen to have had prior problems or known problems with your heart. Okay, so that's the viridan streptococci. Okay, I'll deal next lecture, we'll have a 10 minute break, and I'll deal with the um, pneumococcus and the uh, staphylococcus.